Hello class, this is Professor McDermott with our second lecture um, on agrarianism. That means uh, things having to do with farming or agriculture during the period called the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is a period of American history that runs roughly from 1870 to 1900. It was a period of a lot of economic expansion for the most part, um, a great deal of prosperity for some Americans, but great hardship for other Americans. The term the Gilded Age was coined by the great American writer Mark Twain, the author of uh, Huckleberry Finn, uh, who came out with a book called The Gilded Age. Uh, what did he mean by that? If you uh, check your dictionary, you'll see that the term gilded means something golden, but not solid gold something that's covered with a thin veneer of gold, gilded. Um, what is Twain, tra Twain excuse me, trying to say about America during this period? Well, it may seem to be solid gold, it may seem to be very prosperous, but uh, Twain is suggesting that in reality it's a bit phony, perhaps a bit fake, not solid gold, uh, only gilded. We've already talked about the Transcontinental Railroad that was completed in 1869. I want to talk a little bit more about that now um, because the railroads really had a tremendous effect on American life and on the way that individual Americans saw the world. Um, and this change partly had to do with another very important invention called the uh, telegraph that was invented by Samuel Morse in 1848 that uh, enabled people to transmit messages very quickly instantaneously over long distance using um, a system of dots and dashes that was called the Morse code. Um, the Western Union Company that still exists was founded on this invention of the telegraph. So what the telegraph and the railroad together did was really to shake up the way people saw the world in terms of space and time. So if you uh, think about it, before the Transcontinental Railroad, it took several weeks to get from the Atlantic coast of America to the West Coast. Um, and it took several weeks whether you went over land, an extremely difficult trip, or as more people did uh, by boat, you had to go all the way around the southern tip of South America uh, to get to California, say, from Boston. But as soon as the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, travel times from the east to the west coast dropped dramatically to uh, about a week, and then later less than a week. Um, and so because of that, uh, what happens to our sense of space? Well, the world seems to get a little smaller, doesn't it? Uh, suddenly those vast distances don't uh, seems so vast anymore. In terms of time, uh, before the Transcontinental Railroad and the Telegraph, life was lived at a very slow pace. You know, you didn't really expect anything to happen uh, fast. But uh, beginning with these inventions, Americans start to develop that habit of impatience uh, that we see so much nowadays. For instance, if we're trying to download something on our computers and it takes more than a few seconds, don't we get uh, terribly impatient? Well, the mm -hmm. beginning of that process came with uh, the railroad and, and the telegraph. Suddenly people ex began to expect things to happen um, quite fast. Uh, a big change in consciousness for the American people. I think you see this very uh, symbolically reflected in uh, one of the most important effects that the railroads had on our day-to-day -day life, namely the creation of time zones. Now, before the railroads invented time zones, um, time was different in every little town, essentially was its own little time zone. Uh, and the way they would tell what time it was, was that uh, some old codger who had uh, a watch would come out of his house at noon and he would look up um, and when the sun was directly overhead, 
uh, he would set his watch that was noon uh, in that particular town. So uh, not very scientific perhaps, uh, and certainly not very well suited to the uh, railroad companies. You can imagine the difficulty of creating railroad schedules when every stop um, on the route was uh, essentially on a different time. And so it was the railroad companies in 1883 that actually created the four time zones that we still use today. And uh, this system caught on so that finally in 1918, the United States government accepted the time zones and made them mandatory for all Americans. But it's very interesting that they were initially created by the railroad companies gives you a sense uh, both of the power of these giant corporations um, and also of the huge effect that the railroads had on uh, people's way of thinking. The uh, railroads uh, had the power to make or break the fortunes of individuals and also of cities. Uh, for example, uh, the railroads really were what made Chicago into the great American city that it is today. Previously it had been a sleepy little village on the shores of Lake Michigan, but once the Transcontinental Railroad route was established running through Chicago, um, Chicago really became the railroad hub for the entire nation, and uh, in a way the center of trade for the nation. Um, Western farmers and ranchers uh, would send their products such as beef cattle to Chicago um, where they would be traded to other places and meanwhile Eastern companies uh, if they wanted to sell goods to those farmers that were flocking out west onto the prairies would send them through Chicago and so Chicago became uh, the great boom town of the late 1800s um, farmers in the Midwest region were really dependent on Chicago for their livelihood and increasingly became drawn into the trade network that centered on Chicago. Meanwhile, other great cities suffered, especially those cities that were, um, that had prospered due to the trade on the great rivers. For instance, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, Louisville, Kentucky, all of these cities declined um, after the coming of the railroads. Uh, I remember I used to uh, live in St. Louis and I would drive back to my home in Kentucky through a town called Cairo, Illinois. And it was always kind of um, thought provoking as I passed through there because you could tell uh, in the heyday of the river, uh, the Mississippi River had been uh, a very wealthy town. You could see beautiful old mansions but at this point in time, it's basically a ghost town, and those mansions are crumbling, um, almost completely destroyed. Chicago did suffer one major setback in the year 1871, a great fire that was supposedly caused uh, by a cow belonging to one Mrs. O'Leary that kicked over um, a kerosene lamp in a barn. Uh, we don't know for sure that that's true, but in any case, the Chicago fire did destroy a large portion of the city. But uh, Chicago's prosperity was so great during this period that it bounced back and in fact um, made the city even better after the Chicago fire. Um, for example, uh, using new commuter railroads, uh, many neighborhoods, especially for middle class people, were moved out of the city into what were called uh, suburbs, suburban neighborhoods, so that people could now commute uh, into work on railroads and go home at night. Um, also, after the Great Fire of 1871 cleared out uh, much of Chicago, people began uh, to use this space to build what became known as, the, as skyscrapers. Um, the first great architect of skyscrapers was uh, a Chicagoan named Louis Sullivan, uh, who later uh, taught the great architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, the picture on the left is not from Chicago, but it's one of uh, Sullivan's early skyscrapers in St. Louis called the Wainwright Building. Uh, ten stories. Imagine that. It was unheard of at the time. What really made skyscrapers possible were uh, elevators. Uh, the elevator had recently been invented and so suddenly it was possible to uh, 
uh, make the most of urban space by expanding upward. Another important innovation in Chicago uh, in the late 1870s had to do with the giant meat packing industry. And there were two great tycoons of meat packing named Gustavus Swift and Philip Armour. You should be familiar with those names because if you go to the supermarket even today, you can buy um, packaged Swift meat. You can also buy Armour Star Chili. Uh, the companies these men founded are still with us today. But what really made their fortune was that Swift and Armour began to use uh, refrigerated railroad cars to transport meat all the way to the East Coast. So now um, cows could be raised in Montana, let's say, and they would be brought to Chicago where they would be slaughtered. And then the beef would be carried all the way to Boston or New York City um, to be consumed. So once again, you see Chicago uh, at the center of this vast nationwide trade network. Another very significant thing about the meatpacking industry had to do with the methods that were used to slaughter the cattle. Uh, because really the meatpacking industry created what we call the division of labor. Um, so instead of one guy doing everything that needed to be done to the cow, killing it, skinning it, cutting it into pieces, and so forth, um, the meatpacking plants were organized so that one person would stun the cow, the next guy uh, down the assembly line would kill the cow, and then the next team of workers would uh, skin the cow, um, another group would cut the cow into pieces, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so really what you see in um, the Chicago meatpacking plants is the beginning of modern assembly line production, which as we'll see later in the course, Henry Ford brought to perfection in the auto industry. Um, and these techniques were so fascinating to so many people that the great meatpacking plants actually had galleries where spectators could come um, to gawk uh, at this uh, incredibly exciting new process. Now, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about a very important economic issue of the late 19th century that had to do with the supply of money. Um, we don't really think about this very much nowadays. Um, it's perhaps hard for us to understand why people in the Gilded Age were so passionate about this issue of the money supply. Uh, for us, the Federal Reserve Board takes care of it. So I'm going to try to explain why this became such a crucial issue, maybe the most important political issue during uh, the Gilded Age. First of all, you have to understand that before the Civil War, um, there were no federal paper uh, bills, okay? So uh, the dollar bill did not exist, for instance. Um, the only money that was put out by the federal government consisted of gold and silver coins. Now, there were uh, paper dollars in circulation, but these were put out by local banks that had permission to put out um, bank notes, and normally if you had one of these notes you could take it to a bank and you could get um, the same amount in hard money, gold or silver. But in order to fight the Civil War and to pay the troops and feed the troops, um, Lincoln found it necessary to issue a large amount of paper money, what were called greenbacks. Um, so this was really the beginning of the modern uh, greenback dollar, uh, the federal paper money. Um, and one thing that was remarkable was that you could not uh, redeem a, a greenback for gold or silver. Okay, you just had to trust that this paper dollar was worth what it was supposed to be worth. Now, uh, if any of you are business students, uh, you probably understand the effect when governments just print up large amounts of money uh, without having anything to really back it up, this always produces what's called inflation. What is inflation? Well, it means that the money supply has increased. There's more money in circulation. And so always um, wages and the prices of goods will go up. Uh, usually they will skyrocket. 
okay? Um, and also, interest rates go down, and so it becomes a whole lot, of eas a whole lot easier for ordinary people to get loans uh, from banks. And this was certainly in the, ca the case in the years immediately after the Civil War in the 1860s. With this loose money supply, uh, many people were able to get loans so that they could uh, buy land, um, create farms, and build homes. However, those uh, prosperous times did not last uh, very long. And this had to do actually with overconstruction in the railroad industry. All right, if you look at this map, we'll come back to this slide, but I want to show you this map of uh, railroad lines that were built in the United States between 1870 um, and 1890. You see uh, a lot of railroad construction is going on all over the country. Some of it totally unnecessary. There were some areas of the country, especially in the Midwest, that were over-serviced. They really had more railroad lines than they could support. Um, and so some of these railroad companies went bankrupt. Um, the most famous example of this happened in 1873 uh, when a railroad tycoon named Jay Cook, who also owned a bank, um, began to fall on hard times and his railroad uh, was not making a profit. And so uh, the result of this was that his bank collapsed and it caused a huge financial panic on Wall Street that led to a six-year major economic depression and also uh, led to a loss of confidence in the railroad industry which caused many other railroads to go bankrupt um, during this depression period. Now the president at this time was uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, the great hero of the Civil War. And uh, Grant had a theory about what had caused the Depression. He believed that the Depression had been caused by too much money in circulation. And so the thing to do was to deflate the currency, that is, tighten up the money supply. And so one of the things Grant did was to remove all silver coins from circulation. Um, he continued to put out paper money but required that it be redeemable in gold, that is tied to the gold standard. Um, and so this policy really caused the reverse of Lincoln's policy. It took a lot of money out of circulation, and as a result, you get deflation, not inflation. With deflation, wages go down and also the prices of goods go down, interest rates go up, and it becomes nearly impossible for an ordinary person to get a bank loan. Furthermore, with the prices of goods going downward, this meant that farmers could no longer get um, a very good return on their crops. However, they still had those mortgages uh, to pay off for those bank loans they had incurred back in the 1860s when it was easy to get a loan. Um, but they had less money with which to pay those loans off. And so you see how this issue of money supply could really be a matter of life and death for people, um, especially during this depression of the 1870s. Suddenly uh, farmers began to lose uh, their farms, they began to lose their homes as a result of the tighter money supply. And this problem was only made worse by the fact that farm production was increasing by leaps and bounds because of new uh, machinery that had been invented like uh, the Thresher and the McCormick Reaper. Um, so again, business majors, you are familiar, I'm sure, and probably many uh, other folks out there are familiar with the laws of supply and demand. What happens when the supply of something goes up, but the demand remains constant? The demand doesn't change. Well, um, the result is always that the price of goods is going to go down. And you see how the price of farm products went down, down, down. In 1866, uh, corn 
would fetch 66 cents a bushel in the open market, but by 1889 only 28 cents. Wheat in 1866 was $2.06 a bushel, but by 1889 it had dropped to 70 cents a bushel. And so the result for farmers was catastrophic. Um, and uh, farmers begin to have their mortgages foreclosed, they lose their farms, they lose their homes, they lose everything. So, to try to help farmers, um, a new organization appeared, actually had already been in existence in 1867, but it becomes very important during this depression of the 1870s. It's called the National Grange of the Patrons of Husbandry. Husbandry means farming. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, so most people just called it the Grange. And the Grange was a pressure group that tried to get the government to adopt policies that they thought would help farmers. For example, they wanted silver coins to come back into circulation. They wanted more and more paper money to be printed up so that uh, the currency would once again be inflated and the prices of things would go up and farmers would be able to pay their debts once again and save their farms. The Grange also lobbied the federal government to regulate the railroads so that the, reg the railroads could not charge as much for shipping farmers' products to market um, because this was another great hardship for farmers. And they also wanted the government to regulate grain elevators, which is, um, uh, well, a grain elevator is a place where grain is stored on its way to market. A third thing that the Grange did was to create local cooperatives of farmers to try to pool their resources so that they could buy uh, things they needed together like seed or, or feed for their cattle at a lower cost. But this effort shows some of the problems with this uh, agrarian uh, worldview, the worldview of the farmers. Um, the goal of the Grange and the group that later replaced it called the Farmers Alliance was to empower farmers at the local level through farmers cooperatives, but they found that it was impossible for them to escape uh, the influence of giant corporations and also of the federal government. Uh, here's one example. Um, the farmers cooperatives decided that um, they would buy goods from a new corporation based in Chicago called Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward put out the first big mail order catalog. Um, and so the cooperatives had the bright idea that they would buy uh, large amounts of goods directly from Montgomery Ward through the catalog and they would get huge discounts and farmers would benefit. However, this scheme backfired because um, it was in Montgomery Ward's interest simply to give their catalog to individual farmers. And so what happened was that individual farmers bought their own goods that they needed from the catalog, uh, bypassing the cooperatives, uh, many of which simply disappeared. Another problem was that farmers, many farmers uh, in the Great Plains area had signed contracts with large companies um, to provide grain and other goods for new consumer products um, that were taking the country by storm. One of the most famous of these was Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix, which uh, obviously is still around today. And if you look at the picture on the left, who was Aunt Jemima? Well, the image of Aunt Jemima was based on um, an ex-slave named Nancy Green who had found her way to Chicago uh, after the Civil War and um, her portrait was painted and it became the iconic image of Aunt Jemima. But uh, increasingly uh, farmers lost their independence because they had to fulfill their contracts with giant companies like um, Aunt Jemima and so they really didn't have a lot of leverage or, or bargaining power in dealing uh, with these corporations. And so as a number of farmers lost their farms during the 1870s, uh, many of them fall uh, to the status of, of being sharecroppers or tenant farmers. Uh, this was a way of organizing agricultural labor that was started in the South after the Civil War. 
mostly for black farmers because white landowners didn't want blacks to own land uh, and so a compromise was worked out whereby um, African-American farmers would live on the land they wouldn't own it but they would farm their own plot and then at the end uh, of the harvest they would give part of their crop to the white landowner and they would keep the rest that's sharecropping but increasingly uh, during these hard times for farmers uh, many white farmers also became sharecroppers or tenant farmers um, and so you see uh, the status of farmers becomes a huge political issue very much linked to the whole issue of the money supply during the Gilded Age. We'll talk more about this in the next lecture. But I want to finish up this lecture by just pointing out one more aspect of um, the economic growth of this period, and that is the rise of advertising. Uh, the new corporations are trying to reach a national audience. Uh, some of these names, again, are familiar to us. Pierce Soap on the left convinced the most famous minister in America, Henry Ward Beecher, um, to uh, sell his prestige uh, to sell their soap. And you see the caption here uh, on this soap ad says, if cleanliness is next to godliness, soap must be considered as a means of grace. Um, perhaps a more familiar corporation, Kellogg's, you see one of their early advertisements on the right for um, cornflakes. When, when cornflakes were invented, they were considered to be kind of a crazy fad because most people ate, um, you know, bacon and eggs uh, for breakfast and, and uh, eating grain was considered to be something only health nuts would do. But gradually, uh, cornflakes and other breakfast cereals caught on, again, partly through this power of advertising. Uh, and so we see the rise of a real culture of consumerism that would bear fruit later in American history.